The vitality of academic institution is founded on its students. At the University of Oslo, we have exceptional students. A student initiative was to establish a youth commission. 18 students and young academicians from 14 countries participated in the process, processes of the Lancet University of Oslo Commission on Global Governance for Health. The Youth Commission also convened meetings and conducted independent research. Head of the, U of the Lancet University of Oslo Youth Commission, Une Gopinathan, will reflect on closing the gap in my generation. Please. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, thank you to the organizers for providing the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, my name is Unig Obnaden. I'm a recently graduated medical doctor from the University of Oslo. Uh, I would first of all like to congratulate Rector Ole Petter Uttersen for chairing the commission towards the publication of today's report. I also extend my congratulations to the commissioners, some of them present here today. Having had the opportunity to be at your meetings, I'm aware of the intricate discussions that led to the content of today's report. I'd like to take you somewhere, I tell you a story, which I call a story about governance for health. I'm taking you back to the South Indian state of Kerala, where I was born 27 years ago. However, the story, it begins already in 1817, through a royal decree from the queen of the capital city, stating, the state will defray the entire cost of the education of its people in order that there be might be no backwardness in the spread of enlightenment. The story continues in the beginning of the 20th century, with Narayana Guru and fellow social reformers that confronted the inequities perpetuated by the caste system and thereby contributed to increased, increased influence and public participation of discriminated communities. Then the story reaches the Western world in the 70s, when researchers realized what's going on. Low levels of infant and child mortality, low birth rates, high female literacy, and high life expectancy, which was unprecedented compared to other areas of comparable wealth and income. When the, when the reasons for this progress were sought, researchers didn't find the answers solely in the remits of the health system. As their anthropologist J.W. Radcliffe states here, Kerala's unexpected demographic trends and levels are not the result of direct interventions designed to influence health and fertility. Instead, Kerala's demographic levels evidently reflect broad structural reforms in its political economy. This was said in 1978, which was, by the way, the same year as the World Health Organization's International Conference on Primary Health Care, which called for governments to establish a new economic, international economic order to achieve health for all by year 2000. Kerala's progress was a result of land reforms, protection of agriculture workers, effective public distribution, and governance that distributed wealth and political power from elites to its people. Widespread literacy as well as accessible health care, which set Kerala on the path for health for all already in 1978. Today, in 2013, the state faced another set of challenges of the 21st century. One is a challenge of providing growth and economic opportunities to a healthy and educated population, which is leading to a flux of labor force and skilled resources. The second is a rise in non-communicable disease due to the unregulated marketing and consumption of unhealthy food, tobacco, and alcohol. 50% of deaths in Kerala between the age 30 and 60 years is due to NCDs. 20% of its population has diabetes. The challenge of climate change, which is affecting agriculture and food security. The marine resources for which the coastal communities depend on its livelihood and will be cause of infectious disease outbreaks. 
And then you also have the challenge of regulating multinational activity. One example is the Coca-Cola bottle plant incident from the 2000s, where excessive extraction of groundwater resources led to water shortage and environmental damage in surrounding communities. These challenges are beyond the control of the state government, some of them even beyond the control of the Indian government. They are challenges requiring global governance for health, an idea which I believe we need to set emphasis on certain vital aspects. One is on inequalities. There's a strong attention on inequalities right now, but we must be aware that it's ideas associated with it which will determine our policy preferences. One way of framing the problem is the one of upward mobility, lack of up, upward mobility as the problem and not inequality, which is a view largely emphasizing the individual creation of wealth over redistribution, ignoring the, possibil the, opportun the, ch sorry, the possibility that redistribution have for expanding people's opportunities and ultimately placing the responsibility of reducing inequalities on the individual. This contrasts with another view, that inequalities in itself may indicate that people are being deprived of real opportunities to achieve good health and other valuable goals. As examined by Matthias Sen in his lifelong work, and also shown by Michael Marmot, one of the members of this commission, who has shown that persisting inequalities in health between different population groups is a powerful expression of the freedom and control people have over their lives, an extent to which this freedom is affected by societal constraints, such as poor labor rights, environmental damage, lack of education, lack of health care, econo real economic opportunities, and social security when in need. Thus, the elimination of health inequities must be fundamental to the post-2015 agenda if we are to close the gap in a generation. And, and for getting the necessary guidance for understanding how glo global governance is affecting the very foundations of an equitable society. Institutions and global governance must be brought back to people, and there is potential in using technology in, for this. We saw how social media contributed to the communications during the Arab Spring, and the post-2015 agenda is increasingly being shaped by online platforms like the world we want. There is the technological agenda advancing global health, but this cannot be only about people passively receiving health information or be limited to the remits of the health system. It, has also, it has, must also be about advancing people's agency and participation in society, empowering people to claim rights, and also alert governments and international organizations when such rights are being violated, thus providing space and voice for those who do not always have the privilege of walking the corridors of the UN system. Finally, I'm talking about power, which no longer can be absent from the analysis of global health. The continuous confrontation between different forms of power and interests will shape global governance for health and the real opportunities people have to lead a healthy life. This outright and very honest statement by the CEO of Biopharmaceuticals Bio underlines why it was necessary for this institution, the, Indian, the Supreme Court of India, to reject the buyer's claim for patent in order to make the medication affordable for its population. In many ways, the Access to Medicines campaign is, a, is an example of how much progress can be achieved despite power imbalances and lack of political will in sectors outside the health sector. From the late 1990s, when directors of development assistance told society that providing treatment to HIV AIDS patients in low and middle income countries was not cost effective and feasible, to today, where the powerful combination of policy innovation, like the medicines patent pool, activism like the treatment action campaign, individual leaders like Mr. Arnon Grover, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, and also led the court case when Novartis challenged the Indian patent law. 
and also student organizations like Universities Allied for Essential Medicines who are advocating for the equitable distribution of benef benefits created by knowledge and intellectual property at universities worldwide. This shows us that visible power must not make us blind towards the potential power of institutions, political leaders and movements in the advancing change. There is power in a Jim Kim, a World Bank president, reiterating multiple times that solutions for, in order to achieve universal health coverage, we have to find solutions outside the health sector. There's power in the value of civil society and public interest groups dealing with the impact of global governance locally through public policy processes and judiciary, such as the treatment ca action campaign in South Africa and the Lawyers Collective in India. There is power in international organizations recognizing such efforts, such as the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN's decision to cooperate with La Via Campesina, the largest movement of small-scale food producers in the world. There's power in the unprecedented interest youth and students are now showing to global health, which was spurred by the Millennium Development Goals and by venues created by organizations like the International Federation of Medical Students Associations and many other organizations. And there's now a large involvement and pre presence of youth at various arenas and processes in global governance. Another welcoming development is the increased amount of initiatives from students and young professionals in low and middle income countries. I could have highlighted many such examples here now. I'm highlighting one. This is uh, Lutfi Fadi Lukman, who as a medical student and now a young doctor, created Hospitals Beyond Boundaries, who in Cambodia are addressing the healthcare needs and are just addressing social determinants of health in impoverished communities in Cambodia. Cambodia. Finally, there is the power of ideas. And one idea presented to us today is global governance for health. It must become a normative pr proposition to society, grounded in the experiences of people, the human displaying the human face of global decision-making, and providing guidance for the global governance that has consequences for social arrangements affecting people's health. It must become a powerful international norm from which all specialized UN agencies derive a certain amount of their moral authority and legitimacy. It must unite social movements dealing with a variety of issues and needs to be incorporated into the various political ongoing processes, such as the negotiations towards a binding international agreement on climate change. A Doha development agenda in the World Trade Organization, which needs to develop a more equi equitable multilateral trading system and the post-2015 agenda, all which will determine the future of global health and the potential for closing the gap in a generation. Finally, this is, these are members of the Youth Commission. We will, I know that the, one of them is sitting here, somewhere in Usman Mushtag is sitting here, the rest are following it through the video. I promise to shout a hi to them. Hello, guys. Uh, our report will be released on March 30. I hope it will be a useful contribution to the debate. I hope people will read it and critique it. Thank you for your attention.